This is the final word, and we're very pleased to welcome to the show today uh, the president of the Marlebone Cricket Club for the time being, um, Stephen Fry. <laughs> a couple of months left on, on that appointment. Welcome to the show, first of all. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. I, I imagine it's it's something of an unlikely spot to be um, to be at, at the top of the MCC. You know, maybe twenty years ago, you wouldn't have imagined that that's you, you might have seen yourself as something of an outsider, and, and that wasn't a job that you thought you might land in one day. Twenty months ago, I wouldn't have thought <laughs> it. Um, it is the most astonishing thing. Um, it's. I mean, I won't pretend that it's a job that's at the heart of cricket administration and executive uh, toil. It's more of a ceremonial, ambassadorial sort of role. I've, I've described it before as a sort of mix between a regimental mascot like a goat um, and the Queen Mother, you know, <laughs> uh, that uh, to bless everybody and grin and to host and to occasionally be the face and voice of the club. But you're right, because almost all previous presidents, with the possible exception of... Uh, his late Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, who was president twice, amazingly. Uh, but almost all my predecessors, aside from him, have been cricketers in one way or another. There's one exception I'll tell you about. But when Claire Connor, my immediate predecessor, telephoned me, and as is the custom with the MCC, uh, told me that she had the choice of her successor and that she had selected me, I, you could have knocked me down with uh, a feather. Uh, I mean, I really was astonished. But it occurred to me that, yes, all my predecessors have been cricketers like Claire or her predecessor, Kumar Sangakara, one of the old, both of them all-time greats in their own field. And um, otherwise, you know, previous members had been administrators of cricket, long-serving committee members, uh, cr cricket journalists, and broadcasters. But maybe my job, I thought, was to represent the fan, the, the crowd, the spectator, the interested parties on the outside of the game with no real experience as professional players and no experience as professionals within the game. And And on that basis, I thought it would be great to accept and and to do that, to represent the, the crowd. And the person I called who also was not a cricketer, but was pretty much in my line of country and was president in the early part of the century, and that was Tim Rice, Sir Tim Rice, lyricist. And he said a great and wise thing to me. He said, I'd gained so much from the position. I'd gained insight and friendship, and knowledge and experience. But above all, he said, you'll gain weight. <laughs> <laughs> and that has proved to be the case. There are an astonishing number of dinners involved with cricket. Somehow cricket, it's different from all kinds of sports in all kinds of ways, but one of the differences is in that social sort of the ripples that go outward into clubs and, uh, and other groups of people. And um, so whether it's the armed services or, or, or um, school children or some of the hubs that the foundation has, or whether it's your my oppo, as you might say, in, in Melbourne, the fabulous Melbourne Cricket Club. Um, one is hosting and welcoming them to Lords, to London, um, uh, either playing matches. We did play with Melbourne's team and, and beat them, I'm happy to say. And uh, so the, the, you, you suddenly see how much there is around cricket in, 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 in which you don't necessarily see on television or reported in the newspapers. That was a very long answer, I'm sorry. No, no, that, that's fine. We, we, we want long answers from you. Uh, that Melbourne team had a test player in it as well, Will Pukowski, uh, so not a bad effort for, for Marlebone to, to, to knock them off. Absolutely, a fine player <laughs> who sadly had had a few injuries, hadn't yeah. he? He got um, a really nasty bang on the head. Yeah. That slightly seems to have... Uh, uh, page. What you mentioned, you touched on Kumar Sangakara and Claire Connor um, being your immediate predecessors in mm. the role. On this program, we've spoken quite a lot about how the MCC has modernised in the last 20 years that um, may not have had um, such a particularly proud record in the 20th century of being modern, but in the 21st century, they've done a, a pretty good job of staying up with the times and the figureheads they've chosen by having a non-white man, then the first woman in Claire, now you with your Jewish heritage, first mm. Jew to have the job and, and first openly gay man to have the the job as well. I, th I think that symbolically says something about the direction of travel. I think it does. And, and you know, I'm fully aware and, every, and everybody knows that 
the 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 problem with the MCC is you, you've only got to point a camera at the pavilion during a game, and you will see a few cherry faced individuals in striped um, MCC coloured blazers who do look as if they belong to the last century. And it, I'm not saying they do, and some of them are absolutely wonderful people. I'm sure they're all mostly wonderful people, but they do present a face that for some people confirms their idea that the MCC is stuck in the past. And it, it's a terrible pity because I'm so pleased that you introduced the, the subject the way you did. We we have changed so much and are, you know, let me put it this way. There's a, there's a golden path, or you might say in batting terms, there's a sweet spot on the bat. Um, one edge of the bat looks like wokery to some people and over over obsessions with diversity and inclusion and things like that that some people see as a woke agenda or whatever phrase you like that's the one edge that you can get caught out on the other edge of the bat is reactionary and you're too 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 obsessed with your traditions and uh, uh, and your history and and uh, and the look and feel of lords as being a separate place slightly quieter and more somber during matches because you don't have the trumpeter and the uh, cheering army army and, and 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 these things that's the other edge and you can get caught out on both edges but the sweet spot is 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 i think what what we have achieved and and that is moving forward evolving uh and also respecting a lot of the traditions. You know, cricket, it, it seems to me, is sometimes easily forgotten as what the club is about. It's our, it's our love of this extraordinary game in all its guises, all its modalities. That's what brings us to the MCC. Yes, it's a privilege to play and be a member of this extraordinary ground that lords and 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 its history and to be able to sit in those special seats and and, and feel a part of it. Yes, of course it is. And so so much in demand is it that there's a you know nearly a 30 year waiting list um it's over 40 years in the melbourne cricket club case by the way but then of course you do have uh, afl and other sports to play there so um you know it, it is a, a wonderful thing but we shouldn't forget that what it's all about is cricket and the mcc's role within cricket is it seems to me to push the game around the world and within the United Kingdom as much as possible in the direction of people who don't get a chance to play it very much. And, and we're all aware that the nature of the game means that there is equipment and there are levels which you reach quite quickly as you develop your talents with ball and bat and, and, and gloves, that there are levels which require a certain amount of coaching and an understanding of the myriad complexities and nuances of this beguiling and extraordinary game and that that advantages straight away those with private educations or parents with enough money to ferry them around to nets and indoor nets and bowling machines and all the equipment that allows them to become better and to join clubs and all the rest of it it's harder in in the cities than it is in the countryside we don't have such a good infrastructure as you do in australia with your you know if you fly over um the other Gabba, as uh, as a pilot once described it, uh, not the Gabba the ground in Queensland, but the Gabba the great Australian bugger all. Uh, <laughs> you fly over your wonderful country when when it's not the bugger all, but is actually towns and cities. It's amazing how many cricket ovals you look down on, on, and see. It's really fantastic, um, far more than you would when when flying over an, uh, a, a British town. Of the, uh, I think. So you know, we we um, we may have given the world. The game but we're rather behind in our infrastructure and in allowing girls and boys from all backgrounds to play it and and that's to me again long answer but that's that's the excitement of, of being a member of and, and, and at the moment on the committees of and president of this this club at this moment in time so when you you speak about the image problem when the cameras are turned on the pavilion and, and the substance problem to a degree as well how did you feel during the last Lord's Test when there was, you know, when, when everything boiled over and you had the members in the long room going at the Australians as they passed through? Well, of course, you know, in, in life, one one has a, a variety of identities or, or emotional investments at moments like that. Yes, of course, as president of the MCC, I was horrified and embarrassed to see this. Um, and I wish it hadn't happened. And I'm 
damned annoyed with those figures um, because, you know, they took away from what had been an astonishing game. But I was also an England fan and I'd been slightly heated up by the uh, what I thought was a sad dismissal. I mean, I'm quite aware that it was within the laws of the game and fully aware, too, that many... English wicket keepers have tried the same run out or stumping as it is technically when it's a wicket keeper doing it. Um, and that, you know, it was pretty sour grapesy of me to moan about it. But in the moment, just as an Australian fan, have we done it? Had Johnny Barlow, as he, as he many times had a best, to, as he many times had, had attempted to do, and I'd seen him try, I've seen him roll the ball, you know, in past matches. Had we done that, I know the Australian uh, fans would have been booing and saying that that was really bad form. Uh, you know, the thing calms down. So, but at the time, I had all kinds of different emotional responses. But as I uh, as I realised that the cameras were on those three in the pavilion um, who 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 stopped, um, you know, Kawaja and, and and the others and David Warner and uh, and were obviously very rude to them and accused them of cheating, which is absurd. I mean, if they'd stopped Kerry and said that he was a bit unsporting, I suppose it would have been okay. But to have been so aggressive and uh, it was just out of order and embarrassing. Um, I turn as always uh, to two great journalists. One a great past player or uh, Michael Atherton, but probably the best cricket writer, I think, is Gideon Haig uh, in the Australian. And uh, and I looked at his article the next day and he had immediately, of course, found out all kinds of precedents, including, you know, the, our, our, our iconic cricketer, uh, W.G. Grace, the long bearded fellow after whom the Grace Gates are named at Lords and uh, whose portrait adorns the long room and other places within Lords. Uh, and he had done it. He had done it. He, 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 he'd um, run someone out before the, that fellow, th you know, the fellow thought that the ball was dead and it wasn't. And someone said, Doctor, because he was Dr. Grace. They said, Doctor, that was that sporting. He said, I taught the lad a lesson. Uh, and, and, and Gideon Hager discovered that uh, 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 precedent and was very happy to remind us just how damned hypocritical we are and of course the thing is if you're English you know that other nations have a history with you a history in which our colonialism our arrogance our conceit our snootiness and superiority and our hypocrisy have been you know loud narratives in the history of Australia New Zealand Sri Lanka South Africa <laughs> India so on and so forth you know uh, uh, you'd be a foolish Britain not to recognize that you, you might think some of it's a bit unfair and that uh, you know, it's not my fault as, you know, being generations down from from that. But nonetheless, we live in a country that has, you know, had um, had a lot of its prosperity and history and all the glorious things that we celebrate uh, on, on the back of of a colonialism, one of whose imprints is cricket. One that, uh, and, and, and so there is always this this kind of atmosphere, this subtext, this little background noise to, to what cricket means internationally uh, when, when England are involved. And therefore, I would have hoped that our members would have been aware of that and would have realised how much more important it is for us to be polite and good natured than it necessarily is for you Auss Aussies. I mean, you are very, very sporting uh, and uh, have been, but you're also famous for your ability to put your foot on the throat when you're ahead and, and not take it off until you've, you've got, got the surrender. And that's what great sportsmanship should be. And we, it's taken us a long time to learn that. And one of the things about baseball is, is that there is this greater emphasis on finishing the enemy and being fully committed, committed, and so on. But you also show uh, after the game and even during the game. Look at the uh, handshakes that uh, Zach Crawley got after his extraordinary century, his 180 odd, um, and that was wonderful to see and, and absolutely typical of the, of the Australian spirit. Some people I know, Richie Benno uh, and his generation and the Chapels used to be really pretty dismissive when there was this uh, display of friendship or respect on the field. They thought there was no part of what competitive international cricket should be. Even if, if um, you know, uh, um, a batsman picked up a ball and gave it to a bowler, when, you know, when, if it had just dropped down at his feet, as often happens after a defensive stroke, 
and the bowler's finishing his his run through his uh, his his follow through, and 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 these days sometimes the batsman will pick the ball up and give it to the bowler. Or uh, and uh, oh, well, I remember someone did that, and Richie Bennett said, "I don't know why he thinks he's doing that. It's just ridiculous. He should make the bowler bend his back." <laughs> it, was, it was really funny, and they they never lost it that generation. But uh, the modern generation, there is you know, and it can be mocked. There is a greater sense of mindfulness fellowship kindness uh, you know all i guess all have a fellow enemy and that is the the um, defeat and the, the misery that goes with it and they both respect each other for understanding that they're the only ones who really know what's going on in a strange sort of way aren't they? Well, i think you're right about the, the way in which players have changed their perspective on on these matters you're often hearing them talk about you know their 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 meditation apps and about cl clarity of mm. thought may, maybe baseball um is at the, at the yeah. heart of trying to to free up um cricketers in the middle with so much scrutiny just the, the long room incident and, and i mean maybe it does if you want to really take an abstract perspective, sum up the tension of your role at this time in that there is a membership which is quite conservative, um, the, the club's got quite a progressive agenda, and then as you're walking into it, not, well, as you were giving your cadre lecture, but the year you've been in charge, the ICEC report and, um, and the Azim Rafiq hearings um, that, that ran alongside your, your speech a, a couple of years ago, the cadre lecture, and how that's been um, omnipresent throughout pretty much everything you've done. Mm, it is true. Yes, I, I, I the, 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 gave the cadre lecture on the spirit of cricket um uh a year and a half ago or whatever it was a little longer than that um and it happened to be the exact day that uh, there was testimony going on in parliament about racism in yorkshire and beyond um and yes the day before the the lord's test the icec report came out uh with its damning assessment of uh, of, of english cricket and uh, at, at root what it saw is the the phrase so often used these days, institutional racism, misogyny, homophobia, classism, a sort of sense of the uh, elite classes still running, controlling the game and making it difficult for those outside it. It was Im immensely disappointing because, yeah, everything I've done since I've been had any kind of public role from that lecture onwards has been to, to, to try and suggest that cricket is moving forward, that it should move forward, and that its evolution has always been a part of the history. Because I, I, I'm you know, keen on the, the history of the game too. And it is, I've often half-jokingly compared it to the royal family, something that outsiders regard as faintly preposterous, eccentric, very English, um, but at the same time, which attracts an enormous amount of attention, which can be regarded as old-fashioned, but has survived and thrived and flourished through its ability to evolve, nearly always too late for some, nearly always too quickly for others. And that's that's the sweet spot again. It's it's it, it will always seem too quick for some people. They'll 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 complain, they'll moan, they'll think the game's being destroyed or its traditions are being trashed if it's taken too quickly in one direction or another. Um, it's only, you know, what is it, 25 years ago that uh, the women were members of, of, of the MCC, and, and that was a tight vote. It really was. There were a lot of people who thought it was a very bad thing. This has always been the case with what you might call progressive causes, like votes for women and, uh, you know, the thing that pleased me most, obviously, with the fact that I could marry the man I loved and uh, th things, things like that have, have been... It's extraordinary when you look at the enmity the implacable opposition that that these things originally received which now are completely you think how could anyone have questioned that an example i often give in my lifetime not in your two because you're so young but in the 60s when i was a boy um there was a regular fixture at lords and they were played elsewhere at scarborough and other places in england called gentlemen v players because cricket was cricket players who played for their country and their county in in the british case were divided between those who were amateurs who could afford to play without being paid um and those who were players who were professionals and it, it went right down to how they were listed on the match card the 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 amateurs were mr or the honorable or lord in some cases and sometimes and his royal highness players. from time to time if, yes if exactly. the maharajas were involved Indeed, absolutely, all, 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 all the way back to Prince Ranjit Singhji and the and the, the neighbor the Nawabs and so on. Um, uh, 
and the players were were surname plus initials uh, on the card. There's a famous uh, uh, story of how on one of the gentlemen versus players matches in the early 60s, um, an announcement came over the speakers. Um, it says, there's an error in your match card uh, where it says Mr. F.S. Truman. It should say Truman F.S. <laughs> <laughs> They wouldn't even let the mistakes down. And these players played together on the same team for England or for their county. And then when it, when they were travelling, they would go on HMS Canberra or one of those uh, uh, liners, and they would travel in different classes. I mean, that is, you know, it, it, you kind of laugh at that to think it. But when that was abandoned, uh, abolished, whatever word you want to use, um, there were a lot of people who complained, a lot of respectable people who wrote for newspapers saying that this was, they didn't use the word because it didn't exist in that sense, then woke, but they called it you know, over-progressive uh, kind of liberal nonsense uh, uh, and, uh, uh, as always, a, a disrespect of a long-standing tradition that would harm the game. Um, and I don't suppose there's a single person alive who now believes that that is or was the case. And, and you know, it can sound very arrogant to say progressive causes are always correct, and whatever we suggest will always be, you know, I, I, I absolutely confess that sounds rather uh, uh, overdone. But I think in certain cases, like the equality of, of the sexes, uh, of the encouragement of girls to play the game uh, and, and even equal status in their skills and, and 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 the nature of their competition as boys and then men and and then women, and similarly membership of a club like the MCC should be naturally open to both sexes. And I don't think there's any kind of ever going to be any argument about that in in, in in a few years. And there isn't really much argument about it now, though you do know, and you and I probably sense there are those who think that we overplay our commitment to to women's cricket or women's sport generally and and I did I said to one of the England women I said you know when we'll really know that women's cricket is absolutely accepted and at the same level as men's is when we'll be able to shout how rubbish the team is because uh, we can do that with the England men's team they are useless why did they do that can't they make me sick you know we've said that over the past 10 years. 40, 50, 60 years, my following cricket, I've been able to say that. God, England is so shit, you know. Um, but we don't say that about the women's team at the moment, partly because we don't want to sound as if we're, you know, dis discouraging them or, or you know, we, and yet ultimately that will look as, be looked at as a bit patronising, a bit kind of, oh, well done you, you know. And and the woman I spoke to, I won't say her name because I don't want to involve her in this, but she's a well-known England cricketer. And she, she said, you're absolutely right, because we talk to each other like that. And we're very used to the men being, you know, letting us off when we've been useless. But today, she said, and it was a day when that did happen, we dropped three catches and missed a stumping, just like the England men. And we should be brought to account for it, just like the England men. And I think that's a very good point. Um, uh, and I'm sure you'd, you'd agree with me, probably. There's, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting what you're talking about with, I suppose, the the rightness of progressivism or, or the the smugness of thinking that you're right all the time um but yeah. but when it comes down to discrimination to excluding groups of people it's almost always down to convenience for the other groups of people at the time and then yeah. once that discrimination is ended it becomes um indefensible in retrospect it's yeah you, you... i mean there's always an excuse i have heard people say i won't say from what county they're from necessarily but in defense of a reputation that there's racism in their cricket i've heard them say well muslims don't want to play with us they don't they don't like us they don't like what we eat or what, the fact that we have beer and things like that and and that's a really upsetting to hear them say that because they believe it's true but it just plain isn't and and you know you've only got to look at uh, the very touching it was done without any fuss or publicity but when Moeen Ali was 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 playing for England in in the earlier series uh, and we won the Ashes they made sure that there was non-alcoholic champagne to be shaken up and sprayed when they all celebrated and held up the ashes. They didn't make a fuss about it. They just knew he was a a, a, a Muslim who didn't touch alcohol and that was part of his faith. And they fully respected it. It was the easiest thing in the world. And, and he knows 
you know, that there are times when he, his fellow England players will go off and have a, have a beer or whatever, and he may not want to be with them. And it's, you know, it's not a problem to suggest that it is. And that's the reason um, is disingenuous at, at best. There's been, you used the word institutional racism before, and that gets people's back up when you talk about structural racism or structural elitism and, yeah. and so on. But I've, I've read you write before eloquently about um, the idea of being in the majority and it being unlikely to touch you. If you um, are part of cricket and you are like, us white men it's improbable that you would feel the the, the implicit racism that, that's there for uh, that's been well uh, articulated yes. in the and ICEC you know, report but also you, you've, you've said that cricket fans by their nature are warm and emotional and I wonder whether there's a a through line there between um, cricket fans who are of the privileged backgrounds that we are in relative terms being white men and having had been in the majority for the, the most of our time in the game but still tapping into that warm and emotional side that that should mean empathy follows right it should do. You feel it would. And, you know, I do know that some people who played, played and followed cricket for years and years are very puzzled because they have always seen their worship and admiration and, and respect and fear of, for example, the great West Indian cricket sides of the of the 70s and 80s and, and, and how, you know, how cool they were, as it were you know. And, and so how can how can people say cricket was racist when these great figures like Richards bestrode the world of cricket as the most admired. And, and, and yes, uh, of course that's true. And, and there were plenty of, you know, people who shared uh, the, the changing rooms with them at the various counties where they played, who got on with them and who listened to them and who learned from them and changed their views about, for example, touring in South Africa because Viv Richards had spoken to them about why he felt that, that really was a terrible thing to do, and and a lot of I've heard a lot of cricketers of that generation saying how they were schooled by by their friends the, the, and the, the 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 players they played with who who were from different parts of the world who were Asian or or, or Caribbean or whatever, um, and that that and so they think what's all this about the racism? We we cope so well. They were our friends. Why are they say this? And and I can understand that they're a bit kind of miffed and see it as a modern project to just to paint everything as racist. But I think, I, 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 you know, without being ex-cathedra about it, without saying this is the truth and I know it, um, the, you know, the overused word empathy, but let's think, call it actually sympathy as well. Com as thinking with uh, is basically the, the, the fellow feeling. Imagine yourself being one, someone who is from uh, a minority racial background in Britain or in Australia or, or in other predominantly white countries that are the elite in the administration and the running of the sport and where most of the money comes. We'll come to India in a moment, which is obviously not. Uh, but in, in terms of Australia and, uh, and, and Britain, um, someone from, uh, um, you know, an Aboriginal First Nations background in, in Australia or someone from an Afro-Caribbean or uh, Asian background in Britain, just picture what cricket looks like. <laughs> picture Lord's Cricket Ground, picture, picture the Oval even, picture the average kind of discussion of, of cricket on television. And you can see, yes, I mean, golly, there's a big gap between where I am at this primary school in the middle of Bradford or the middle of Manchester and the England cricket team now and those commentators and those people who write for the newspapers and those people like Stephen Fry, who are the public face of something like the MCC. And just try and remember that. it's it's Yes, you can tell all sorts of stories about how we get on with each other. And, you know, I, I'm sure there are all kinds of people who are quite rightly never describe themselves as racist, but it is just being aware. And that's originally what the word woke meant it just meant waking up to seeing it from someone else's point of view and and i think that's what we've been a bit slow at doing so uh, you know without wishing to join in a chorus of everybody's racist or you know anything like that because i know so many people do their best to try and be better people in all kinds of ways not just in in terms of race and, and things like that but just in terms of their everyday lives we all do uh, we all try and be better um and a lot of being better does involve imagination. It involves putting yourselves in the shoes of other and, and others and trying to see the world as they see it. And when you do that, I think a lot of things become clear that might not have been clear before.
imagination is related to something that struck a chord with me from your Cowdery lecture about falling in love with the game by reading about it. Um, you said, I suddenly mm. saw something intensely fascinating and beautiful in the drama of the game, the rainbow of possible outcomes, the exquisite balance of it all, the luck, the timing, the weather, the interdependence of so many factors, something that we've all been through over the last 10 days, yeah. I suppose, at, at Old Trafford. <laughs> but um, but it, it, it struck it struck me because, you know, like you, I was an extremely uncoordinated, um, physically inept child and youth <laughs> and who, who couldn't really join in with any facility, um, but still was able to be captured by a game that I, I wasn't good at playing. Um, I'm interested to, to hear more about your, your early years and, and how the game gets a hold of you in the first place. Yes. Well, you, it, for those of us who are not born with the greatest athletic grace and... Uh, speed and coordination it is uh it is frustrating to, to to love the game if i didn't love it i wouldn't regret so much my absolute ineptitude but um the great thing is it's a game of such richness and depth that it has a literature and it has a, a lore with an l-o-r-e um that is second to none i mean even baseball can't quite match it uh in in those terms the the history the tradition the statistics the extraordinary variations and so on that I mentioned that you quoted. Um, and 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 for me, the literature was perhaps the opening for it. I, I fell in love with reading and writing from a very early age and devoured books and was of a generation when, of course, there was no internet and my parents didn't really have the television. Uh, you know, it was kept in a cupboard. It was a small thing taken out when there was a, I don't know, Churchill's funeral. <laughs> a coronation. A royal something. wedding or something like that, exactly. Uh, the World Cup, I think we were allowed to see the 1966 World Cup, which was a fuzzy black and white thing that went on in the corner of the room. So reading was everything. And I fell in love with certain writers, including uh, P.G. Woodhouse, who, who created Western. And his early books, a lot of his early books, are, uh, are set in schools and involve cricketers. Uh, his great uh, series Mike and Smith. Mike Mike is a superb cricketer, and and he goes into the games and he describes them. and And I was learning more about cricket reading this uh, late Victorian, early Edwardian uh, schoolboy stories um, than I than I was by watching watching it on television or listening to to, to the radio commentary, because I I was inside the mind of the batter as as and 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 how he was trying to read the bowler. I was inside the minds of the bowler as he was trying to, you know, fool the batsman. And I suddenly saw, oh, that's what a slower ball does. Caught and bowl. Why? Oh, I see in this here and that there. And 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 it, it suddenly kind of just opened up for me. Um and 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 I don't think I, I would have had that without those stories. And then, of course, I read all kinds of other school stories and other school, you know, you found things in the library and and, and, and it grew from there. Watch and as you know, if you're not, sorry, I would just say, if you're not physical, one thing you can do is take a sharpened pencil and lie on your tummy and have a score book and, and take pleasure in the way you can join up the three dots next to the other three dots and make a letter M to show that, that was a maiden or a W if one of them was a wicked. And and, and so you learn to score and uh, and you find yourself useful that, you know, the, the players come back into the in, into the pavilion at the end of the game and immediately the birders go, what's my average? And you go, oh, wait, wait. And you're doing, trying to do calculations and and, 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 and the, there's no other sport where that can happen. You can't do that with football. You can't do that with any other sport, really. It's just amazing. Yeah, the joy. One of the joys of cricket is that so many people, in addition to the 22 in the middle, contribute yeah. to making it function. Um, you uh, you go back and look at your your body of work when you're a younger lad. You know, you have your moments on the way to university, spend some time in prison and all the rest of it, well documented. But <laughs> by the time you reach Cambridge, you're you're, you're mm. you, you you catch fire, right? Um, creatively, you you meet Hugh Laurie, and, and the rest is kind of history. What I found in in that phase of my life my early 20s when I was quite busy doing something else I lost cricket for a while I found it hard to um, dedicate as much of myself to the game that I loved as I would have otherwise wanted to I, I stopped playing for a few years I just couldn't quite you know, keep up with it as much as I would have wanted to was that the same for you because looking at your CV from that time through the 80s and 90s you are so ridiculously busy um, doing everything that, that, that is possibly there to be done um, what was your relationship like with cricket when you were just under the pump to such an extent professionally it's a really good point. In in at university, I uh, w one thing that kept me vaguely connected was 
that uh, um, a, a friend of mine since since I was born, he, he was born like three weeks earlier than me, was his name was Nigel Popwell, and he played uh, for Cambridge and, and got a blue. In fact, a double blue because he was a boxer as well. And, and then he went to uh, Hampshire for, for, for a short time while he was still an undergraduate, still a student. And then he went to Somerset and played for Somerset in the same side as Joel Garner, Viv Richards, Ian Botham, so it was quite a legendary side. Um, so I kind of, and I, I see him occasionally. I remember once, ah, oh, he must have been in the 70s, in the 77, 78, and uh, um, we were having a drink in a pub and I asked him who, who, who whom I should look out for. And he said, there's a there's an all-rounder called Ian Botham you should definitely look out for. He's extraordinary. And he's an amazing swing bowler. And he described how he'd seen the ball hoop from him. And he said, nobody understood how he did it. And he said, but the most remarkable person I've ever seen is a batsman called David Gower. He said, you've never seen any stroke play like it. And he described him. And I remember looking out for the name and then seeing him and seeing him play for Leicester and, 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 and agreeing that it was. So I was sort of vaguely aware, you know, when new names came and then in 1981 which was just after i graduated hugh laurie and i um uh, were watching the 1981 botham's ashes as they're called because he rescued well he started by being captain disastrously famously and we lost the first two uh, and at lord's one of the most famous moments in the pavilion <laughs> before the recent uh, embarrassments were, was was his um, duck uh, uh, in the second innings, walking to com in complete silence past the rows uh, uh, of members and then into the long room and, and everyone saying he's, his days are numbered as captain and maybe even as a player, this is so disastrous. He resigned before he was fired and then famously Mike Brearley was telephoned and became captain and and then this extraordinary series took took, took place. And, 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 and that mattered because uh, Hugh and I were obviously just completely amazed by his feats of, as with bat and ball um, in rescuing first the Headingley and then the uh, um, Edgbaston and, and, and Old Trafford tests. And um, uh, we called our show because we were asked to go to Australia, me, Hugh, Emma Thompson, and the others of us from the Cambridge Footlights, as they would call this comedy club, um, uh, an Australian entrepreneur, impresario, I think is probably the right word, called Michael Edgley, uh, came to see us in, in Edinburgh that year, 1981, just after the ashes, uh, or while they were still going on, actually, and asked if we wanted to tour Australia with our show, which was absolutely astonishing, uh, and was offering us real money to do it. He was going to fly us out, pay us, and we were going to go all around Australia. So we called our show... Both of them the musical. <laughs> we thought it would at least attract attention. And uh, some people came and said, oh, it's not really a musical. Uh, but uh, no, I enjoyed it. But there was no Ian Botham involved. And <laughs> had to explain that the title was just a red rag to a bull to try, <laughs> try and sort of get attention. But that, that was amazing. And, and that's my first visit to Australia. And actually, we, the first place we went to was Western Australia, to Perth. And uh, there was a... A marathon, uh, not a marathon, a telethon was on. Uh, and I remember we went on 6KY and uh, and they said, do you want to get involved with our telethon that our, you know, the television branch of the company was doing? And part of it w w meant we went to the WACA and were bowled out by Terry Alderman and Dennis Lilly. And for each, all we received, I can't remember how much, you know, 10 bucks or something went to the, um, went to the thing and and they bowled very gently to us and then suddenly we noticed Dennis Lilly absolutely hammering the ball at us I mean terrifying and we we, we came off and, and said it was all right and then suddenly we got a hole over of the most I mean we just had to curl up in the ball said and, and our, our stage manager Greg said yeah it was probably my fault I said what do you mean he said well I, I happened to mention to him the name of your musical, of your show, that it was called Both in the Musical. He went, oh, really? <laughs> so, it's amazing I've got a skull left. <laughs> it was very funny. Anyway, sorry, that, that was just the cricket connection to the comedy. But after that, once we got back to England, yes, we, we were asked to do TV shows and things like that. And cricket took a bit of a backseat. I mean, we always... Hugh, Hugh was a great lover of the game as well, and we would always, wherever we were in the world, initially ring each other up and now, of course, text each other and 
sort of follow the games together, follow the matches together, and uh, you know choose the England side and um, you know be be the sort of wise asses that uh, fans of sports always are. <laughs> I'm interested in that friendship because it, it goes through that period. You're, you're, you know, Cambridge footlights together when you're students and you're scrapping and you're trying to get somewhere. You do some early sketch comedy stuff. It's basically through the whole of the 80s before you start to get somewhere. You get momentum. You're on Blackadder together. Mm. And then you get your own show together. And maybe self-indulgently, but it's it, it has a little parallel with what Adam and I have done over the last 10 years or so where we would have been a few years older but we got into cricket coverage as freelancers and we we teamed up we we decided that it would be easier to do it together than to to do these things separately and i think the fact that we both have managed to establish careers in this this area of life is a lot to do with the fact that we had that moral support you had somebody else in the team Absolutely. with you you had a creative um endeavor that you weren't just out there on your own. And so I'm, so I'm interested in that, um, the strength of that friendship and how enduring it's been and, and how significant it was, particularly in, in that first decade. Well, I'm I'm happy to say very very strong, and, and we you know we never we never rowed, we, uh, and and there was never any resentment or competition between ourselves. There was only uh, a drive to 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 be better and to try and get things right. So we were incredibly fortunate to discover each other and to have that sort of a relationship. It was a perfect thing, and I never. You know, uh, uh, I, fortunately, I never, I, I never fell in love with him, in, except as a person. That would have been <laughs> embarrassing. Um, but, but, but we, it was love in in the other sense, in a platonic bromance sense. And, um, I, you know, he, I always knew that there were things he could do that I couldn't dream of doing. You know, uh, music and and things, and indeed athleticism. He's a natural athlete. He was a rowing blue at, uh, and indeed rowed for uh, for Great Britain in the Junior Olympics and. Uh, uh, he's also naturally good at tennis and cricket and things like that, and um, and, and moving and fighting and, <laughs> and other such things. And you know, we, we had our own, you know, and I had my thing with words, as you might say. Um, and we complimented each other uh, in the uh, not in the sense of saying, "Oh, you are clever," and "Oh, how wonderful you are," but in the <laughs> complimented, not complimented, and. Um, uh, and it just worked. Uh, but but and we've stayed friends. And he he, he I'm godfather to his three children, um, which is rather greedy on, on my part or on theirs to 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 have to, to have them all as godchildren. But I but I love them all. And 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 indeed, um, he and uh, and one of his sons came as my guest to to watch one of the days at Lords, and it was wonderful having him there. And it, and like all great friendships, and I'm sure you you and Andrew the same. Um, you, you just you pick, you can always pick up where you left off. You can go for you know he might be off as he was recently to um, Athens to, to do some filming, and I was off earlier uh, to Poland and Germany for three three months to do a film. Um, and then you know we saw each other in a restaurant in London when we had both got back and almost started on the last conversation we'd had four months earlier when we hadn't seen each other. And the, that that's just a wonderful to be at ease with someone like that it's, it's a huge treat and i often as I'm, I'm sure you do sort of get communications from people who ask for advice about how you might start off in the world of comedy or writing or tv or film or something like that and um and and the, the first answer i come up with really is is always to find someone like yourself not necessarily identical to yourself but someone who compliments you someone who you're a fit with um, who whom you can try things out with um because to do to do it on your own is always immensely difficult uh, uh m much easier to do it with with someone else you you, you as uh, people used to say to us which we always thought sounded a bit weird so i what you two just sort of sit in the room and spark each other off do you and, and i said well that's a peculiar way of putting it but yes i suppose that's what we do <laughs> yeah it's a nice idea i mean and the fact that both of you are so we touched on it before so prolific you know from outsiders right in, in your case perhaps more acutely mm. being um fr from the background you were from and, and having had a few troubles early earlier on and then mm. being absorbed within that cambridge bubble and <clears throat> being able to make the very most of it as a creative with him but coming out the other side of it and 
I don't know where you would draw that mark between when you were an outsider and an insider, but I guess the ultimate of being an insider is your current gig at the MCC, if we want to be a bit trite. But yeah. no, but the, the, the idea of progressing into, uh, dare I say, it, polite society from having been a bit of a renegade early doors. Well, and, it's, almost, mm. it's almost being absorbed by the establishment in a way. You've got, you've got youthful sort of renegade types who are a bit edgy and they're comedians and you know, they, they, they don't fit in this particular box. But if you give them enough time, the establishment can sort of amoeba-like <laughs> oh, yeah. kind of soak them up. Once you become successful <laughs> enough, then you're all right to be accepted. But then they can also Absolutely. neutralize you to an extent because you, you become part of it rather than sitting outside it. It's a really good point. I mean, I am an extreme example. I've been quite monstrously extreme of that. And I, it may be connected to to the history of Jewish people in Europe and that, and that word assimilation. Um how you assimilate. And from the earliest age, I have never felt part of the establishment. And so I've gone out of my way to make myself feel part of the establishment. I, you know, there are two options if you feel that. One is to stand outside it even more and to proclaim yourself the enemy of the establishment. And I hate them all and I never want to be a part of it. Or perhaps there are the cheaper and less admirable <laughs> approach, which is mine, which is to throw yourself into it. So, I mean, I, I was... T talking about this to a, to a friend the other day who called me up, a very well-known friend, as it, as it happens, and he said, oh, we haven't had lunch for, for a time. And he said, I'm only a member of one club. We could have lunch there. He, as I, he said, I seem to remember you're a member of quite a few. And I then I thought, yeah, how many, members of, how many clubs am I a member of? And I went through and it was one, two, three, four, five. There's the, the gentlemen's clubs. Well, I'm not even counting the MCC here. I just mean... Clubs like the Garrick Club and the Athenaeum and all. So I remember, I think I'm eight of those, plus the sort of clubs like the Groucho Club and the Soho House. And uh, I'm a member of four of those. Uh, and then there's clubs like the MCC, um, which I'm also a member of. And uh, it, it adds up to an enormous amount of money each year to pay the subscriptions. And what am I trying to prove to myself? It's just preposterous. I don't have time to visit. Many of the clubs I haven't visited for years, literally, but I'm still paying how many hundred a, a year it is, if not more, just to be a member of it. It is sick in a strange sort of way, but it is a deep, obviously a deep need to feel that I belong. And and I wrote in one of my autobiographies that the the sort of fate of the anti-hero in in, in in the modern novel and film uh, and the anti-hero in one's own life, which is oneself, is this tension between wanting to stand apart from the herd, the mob, and wanting to be a part of the mob. And, and simultaneously, you want to stand apart. I am me, I am different, I am not ordinary, I'm not like them, the establishment, the institutions, the mass. I am quirky and different and so on. But there's also the bit that I need to belong, I want to be shown that I am valued and that I'm part and hugged into this world. We, we and, crave and acceptance. We now use, yeah, we now use different words like hubs because it used to be that we regarded the world as... Um, hierarchical and that there were you 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 reach this level and then another level and another level and the top level was the but we now see the world as networking and being nodes and hubs uh, uh, that aren't necessarily one higher than another but they they are some are regarded nonetheless as more elitist i suppose than others and and one one feels a need to belong to a hub or a node and that node can be identity it could be your sexuality your gender your nationality your 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 etc 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 your race um or, or it can be something like uh, something more to do with your interests and your concerns and your beliefs uh, but those that's the way we organize ourselves and it's been made all the more extreme in it because of social media of course and, and, and the way we connect now but um it is a a puzzle and 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 um when you get to my age, I'm 65 now, you start to think about how you could have done things differently. And as you try and drift off to sleep, you put yourself back at, I don't know, the age of 20, 21 and think, maybe I should, should I have concentrated on this? Should I not have done that? Should I have realized how cheap and valueless this side of life is or how valuable this other side is that I've always ignored and so on? And of course, it's an endlessly foolish game. You can't go back and to worry about mistakes you've made in the past is uh, is 
absolutely a waste of time and and, and emotional energy, but you still can't help it. No. <laughs> I suppose <laughs> it is it's part of the human condition to always, yeah, <clears throat> to an extent, absolutely. be looking backwards. And, yeah, and that one vulnerability. Of the main ones, sorry. One of the main ones, and I don't know how you think about it, I'm sorry to, to, to hog the conversation like this, is... Um, is the very nature of one's skills at something you love so much like cricket. And and um, I remember thinking when I was 17, say, or 16, that I, I would give anything, anything. I would sell my soul to the devil. I would make a Faustian pact if I could be given the talent to play cricket professionally for a county and maybe even good enough to play for England, that I would give up anything. Um, and then as I got a bit older, and then I started to watch people whose careers I had witnessed from the beginning, like Ian Botham or, or David Gow, whoever it might be, and then saw them get to the end of their careers and start to leave the game. And then some of them weren't as gifted at commentary and, uh, and, and had to leave cricket entirely. And then I started meeting because... I had friends who were members of the MCC. I wasn't yet a member myself, and I was invited to boxes, and I saw ex-players from the 60s and 70s who were now in their 60s and 70s. And I saw that so many of them were alcoholic and trembled and shivered with the horrors of their drinking, and they were or they were bitter and resentful and unhappy. And some of them, because I, I won't mention their names, that's pointless, but some of them were some of the greatest heroes of their age. I mean, utterly you know, posters of them uh, uh, and and just worshipped by, by school children everywhere. And, and now they were a mess and they were unhappy. It's very Greek and, and in I, a way, I remember thinking, the unhappy hero. Uh, yeah, I, I remember thinking that Faustian pact is all too real in a strange sort of way. You, it, it, and and uh, my love of Greek myths also made me think of, of, of Achilles, who was... Whose, whose mother was told that uh, that her son would have two possible futures. One was to be the greatest hero of his time, of any time, a golden, glorious blaze of heroism. Um, but it would be a short life and it would be ended soon. Or the other was to be a quiet, unnoticed, happy life that went on in obscurity for a long time. And the mother, of course, she said, I want the second for him. I want the second. But, of course, he wanted the first, and he had it, and he was the greatest hero of them all, and he did die very young. And he is, for me, the patron saint of athletes and sports people because that's that's the life they have, is that blaze of glory that ends. And you could say the same of dancers and other things that are age-related in that way. And so you... It, it, the revenge it's not the revenge of the nerd it's the revenge of the un, the unco it's the the kindest word for the uncoordinated person at school there are other worse ones as we know um but the reve our revenge is that that our life doesn't fall apart in quite the same way as it might do for those physically gifted it's a lovely diversion i mean the the um what's that said about athletes that they die twice right they die when they retire and then a and then a second time and there's that vulnerability which pervades yeah. the rest of their lives <clears throat> trying to get back the the first bit to the extent yeah. they can and to to feel accepted a second time around having yes. in in a lot of ways um led a life of, uh, of of being told how great they are for their their 20s and indeed into their 30s and you know that vulnerability you're describing as well about wanting to be included about wanting to um have people um uh, want you and that, I yeah, find that really validate, interesting. Validate. Yeah, validate you and yeah. having been an outsider and mm. having been become, I suppose, in some respects, the ultimate insider as far as the life you've been able to lead. But, you know, I wonder whether earlier in your life, having been such an outsider with your sexuality, I'm not sure whether your religion or your, your um, origin um, feeds into that as well, but um, whether you um, feel strongly more, more hinged to that um, because of the fact that um, for a long time you were seen as someone who, who society wouldn't necessarily accept in quite the same way. I think there is an element to that. I mean, I always imagine when when I first sort of was aware of what being gay meant in the world, and not even the word gay was used then, um, you know, when I was 13, 14, 15, and just, just aware that that's who, who I was and, and how I felt and how... All it meant as a future was exile, shame, disgrace, imprisonment, mockery, all kinds of terrible things. There was no future I could imagine that would be... Uh, content except secrecy, except denying who I was. Only that would allow me. Uh, everything else was public horror and or, or exile. I would have to go to some country where, you know, which I 
couldn't really imagine what that was. Um, and and so I, incredible to me still how, how fortunate it is that th through the work and effort and uh, sacrifice of, of our, as it were, gay ancestors and, and some many of them still alive who, who, who went through all kinds of pain and uh and and public opposition to 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 get to the stage where we are now in terms of the jewishness there that was less so because i know partly because my family was you know my mother's family who was the, the jewish side were not as we say in uh in, in we're not from we're not, we're not orthodox we're not observant they were i suppose the awful phrase would be haute bourgeois they they you know they that they'd, they'd made money in, in in business and they they were assimilated. They were they were not interested in the Friday night dinners and the uh, the eating kosher and um, you know wearing particular clothes or beards or hats or anything of that nature, which some more the more religious Judaic Jews do. But you're still Jewish. I mean, that's the weird thing. You know, uh, it may be you're a bad Jew in terms of your religion and your uh, you know everything else. But uh, if if an anti semite would still throw a brick at you, or in the case of uh, the 1940s, you'd still get carted away, as, as so many of my family were, to to a death camp. Then you you obviously realise that being Jewish is a strange condition. It's not just a religion; it is a, a racial thing. Even if, like me, you don't look or sound Jewish, uh, whatever looking or sounding Jewish is, I think we're sort of aware that you know a lot of people are still surprised when I say I'm Jewish. And um, uh, but so I wasn't. I didn't really feel. That people uh, maybe they did maybe behind my back people did go as a Jew boy or something but I don't think so I was never aware of that um, and indeed because my profession was in acting and writing and the arts I never really felt any homophobia either because uh, let's face it <laughs> we are bound in those fields um, so it was uh, easy, easier for me than for so many others and I've always been aware of that. It's interesting to me that your your list of iconically British things that you've done I mean you, so you talk about reading Woodhouse and falling in love with cricket and then you end <laughs> up getting to play in the Jeeves and Worcester adaptation. Um, you get to be in Alice in Wonderland, you get to be in the hobbit you get to be in the spice girls movie um you get okay. the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy um you read the harry potter audiobooks the, it, the sherlock holmes game of shadows as well i played mycroft holmes that's pretty uh english i suppose Absolutely. yes you're right isn't that strange? iconically british things that you've been able to, yes. to be involved with yeah, there's no getting away from it, is it? And 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 some people do sort of think of me. The word, the dread word, quintessentially is put in front of my English lot, you know. Um, and which only comes with right. a certain age as well. You can't be quintessential as as a younger. No, you can't. That's right. And uh, as Alan Bennett said in this country, he said, you know, you you know, you get a knighthood if you can open a boiled egg at the age of eight. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but you know yeah it, it is um it sometimes i think one of the interesting things about being so called quintessentially english is that most of the quintessentially english people you think of are not very english i mean that's to say i would think probably very high on the list of quintessentially english would be winston churchill and agatha christie both of whom were only half english like me in that sense um and I think that is part of what being English might be, is is a sort of, in the same way that, you know, the English national dish is chicken tikka masala. Uh, we, we do, for all the stuff in us and perceived racism or whatever that we were talking about earlier, we do embrace things from other cultures very quickly and easily and absorb them and maybe uh, appropriate them if some people want to put it that way but uh, uh, so to be quintessentially English is not to be stuck in the mud hidebound looking just around the chalk downs of um, Surrey and Sussex or something it is uh, you know it is about a sort of more outward looking and and the more quirky and I suppose what we think of as the eccentricity of English is very often where Englishness fights itself uh, and tries to deny its Englishness, as it were. And so you get a sort of madness or a humour or something. And that's, and, and indeed, we, you know, we've thought of as this, in some ways correctly, as a race that has been very arrogant and very superior in its treatment and very convinced in the belief of its own greatness, of its culture and its values. But actually, all our real heroes 
have been failures and comic failures at that. It's Basil Fawlty, it's Captain Mannering from Dad's Army, it's uh, David Brent from The Office, it's uh, it's 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 Blackadder. It's it's people for who, who have high standards, but but who let themselves down, or whom the world lets down, and they're surrounded by fools and idiots, and everything's going wrong, and it's all a bit of a disaster. Uh, and th that's the sort of great tradition, if you like. And I think. I think that is that. That's what excuses us is, is our ironic awareness of how crap we are so much. I mean, that's what Barmy Army was founded for, really. It was there, you know, it was there to cheer on the Michael Atherton days when we were losing by an innings and two hundred runs or whatever, you know? <laughs> and they were still going Barmy Army, Barmy Army, like that, somewhere else. In, <laughs> yes. In, in... Uh, I'm aware we've already eaten into more time than we were yes, technically sorry, allocated, which um, which is on us. Yeah. But uh, just in closing, I suppose no, um, uh, we should um, we should we should ask you whether um, you feel slightly bereft at the fact that you'll hand over the, the captain's armband at the MCC to Mark Nicholas in a couple of months, and this will be your your one full summer in the job, and how you'll deal with that sense of loss when it's all over. Yes, it will be. Um, uh, there are huge advantages to swinging into Lords and uh, popping around to the community room and, uh, and, and being involved in the day-to-day -day running of Lords Cricket Ground and of the MCC and, and its work. Um, but I'll still be a patron of the foundation, which is the arm of the, the charitable arm, so important to the MCC that looks out into the hubs, uh, to use that word again, that, that, that get girls and boys involved, 77 of them around the United Kingdom, and indeed the visits abroad to Nepal and Rwanda and the, the Lebanon and, and, and in the future, who knows, uh, South America and other such places to, 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 to get cricket building and building. It is the second most popular sport in the world by a long way. Of course, a lot of that is to do with India. And I never finished that point about, of course, uh, India is the supreme power in cricket now because of the IPL and, and because of the population of the country, uh, all of whom seem to be absolutely committed and, and to be adoring of cricket. And they are a great cricketing nation and they will have a huge sway in how the game goes. And that's only only right. They deserve it. I mean, w w it may be that it started in the in the South Downs of England um, hundreds of years ago. But, uh, you know, I, as I sometimes compare cricket to the tomato, um, the tomato is regarded as part of national cuisine in it Italy, in Britain, in Australia, I dare say, in China and in India. But it doesn't come from there. It never existed until explorers took it from its single home, which was South America, but now it's become part of the world. And cricket is like that. Yes, it may have begun in a small part of England with shepherds, but it is now as much at home, if not more, in other places around the world on coconut matting, stickball, different versions of the game, beaches, uh, and in the ovals of Australia and the uh, uh, and, and the streets and cricket grounds of, of the South, South Asia and West Indies and South Africa and so on. So, yeah, I, the, the foundation I'll still be involved in, but I won't be. I won't be. Good morning, Mr. President. Uh, the gate. They do call me Mr. President <laughs> everywhere I go. It's really exciting. But that that will be gone in a in a month and a half, two months and a half. <laughs> and there might be, might be some sense of relief in it all. Uh, uh, I think so. Yes, yeah, some of the administrative having to look at spreadsheets uh, uh, is is you know I'm not good at that. <laughs> Stephen Fry, it's been quite a journey through uh, tomatoes, the myth of Achilles, and uh, going all the way back to the works of P.G. Woodhouse. Uh, been great to have your company over the last hour. Thanks for joining the final word. I've loved it. Thank you very much for having me. All the best. <laughs>